is power and this is powerful stuff wellness education cannabis advocates of nevada present the weekend 702 nevada cannabis news hour with the weekend radio team for the next 60 minutes we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation now let's fire up the news hour here is the weekend radio team Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Kurt Dukach. Today in the studio, I have my guest, or co-hosts, I should say, Michael McCullough hey and there. Harry Haichu. And uh, behind the boards, we got Beth making us sound great, and John behind the video there making us look, and look great, or try to make us look great, I should say. <laughs> so we're coming to you live from Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corp. If uh, you're looking for our show, it's at www.dbcorp.com. And go to the D-Day page and listen to us live. So, mm-hmm. so let's start off with a little local news. Uh, big uh, hubbub uh, about the newspaper, huh? Yeah, there, there's been um, uh, there, there's been a lot of back and forth discussion on this issue. Last week on June seventh, uh, the Las Vegas Review Journal posted an editorial, an unsigned editorial, meaning it was likely written by the entire editorial board um, or that had input, and it, it was entitled "Pot Legalization Is a Bad Bet." for Nevada. And I, I won't subject you to the whole awfulness of it, uh, but you know, they, they say that in a freewheeling state known for legalized gambling and a lax approach to prostitution, recreational weed comes with health, safety, and social costs that make legalizing marijuana a dangerous proposal for Nevadans. They say that legalizing weed would jeopardize the health of countless Nevadans, expose more people to drug abuse and addiction, put excessive stress on the state's health care facilities, and do little to relieve the state's bloated prison population. Wow, what a load of crap that is. is. Yeah. Yeah. Pick apart every single one of those. And they used to say that, that, you know, smoked marijuana is bad and who, you know, how can you, you know, medicine, how can you be putting something into your body medically when you're smoking burning leaves? And so it used to be smoking that's bad. Now, now the RJ has stretched it, that marijuana contains nearly 500 dangerous chemicals when inhaled or ingested. So mm-hmm. now they're saying, and, and they're talking about uh, five times more tar than in tobacco smoke, but if you're eating it, you're not getting any of that potential tar where it would do harm in your lungs it's just going to pass out through your digestive system um, they, they're also saying uh, that it causes cancer when we all know at this point that uh, cannabis has very strong anti-cancer properties and they say it causes irreversible brain damage <laughs> what do you think they mean don't no, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I don't even know what to say. Yeah. I, I, it's, 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 it's hard to listen to, and uh, it, it is. They, uh, and, and, but I got just a little bit more because I'm not going to read the whole thing because they come up with the same old tired trope that marijuana is both addictive, claiming that one in ten people is going to get hooked on it. We know it's not physically addictive, and people can become psychologically dependent on anything on chocolate, on wine, right? But they say it's a gateway to more deadly drugs. You ever see anyone going through caffeine withdrawals? Um, <laughs> they, they, they have it's the jitters, not happy. too. No, they're not happy. But, but the thing about this is, everything that they're saying here is patently untrue. And yet, there are so many people out there who believe anything that they read in print, and the RJ's target audience, uh, these editors seem to think well, that that's what's going to happen. Well, who, who gets the newspaper anymore? I do. No, <laughs> yeah, but the, the majority of people that are in print are older, older people, people that are yeah. home, have time to sit and read the, the newspaper, you know, and through their day. Personally, so. I think that the RJ is a great and valuable resource when you're training puppies in the house. You can't have enough of those Sunday RJs around. You know? So yeah, I just think it's disappointing that there's no accountability. Like they can just publish this stuff and it's blatantly false. Yeah. There are no consequences for it whatsoever. There's mm-hmm. really nothing we can do at this point because it's owned by one man. There is no board of directors we can go to to bring our issue up to. One guy owns the whole 
the whole shebang, you know, and it's kind of it, it. They fired John Smith, the, the best, you know, the best editorial reporter. They, I, I'm not going to get into it. You know, it's yeah, just terrible. It's just gone in a really they, bad they direction. They don't want they don't want free thinkers there. They want they want people that are going to publish stories that push their own agenda. And, exactly. And that's, that's not that's, what it's supposed to be about. Yeah. The media is supposed to be the check and balance for government and for society. It's not supposed to be helping the bad guys as I, I, put I agree it. with you to a point the when the news when you have a, a reportage piece when they're reporting the news they are supposed to be fair uh, unba not not unbalanced but they're supposed to be accurate they're supposed to relay yeah. the facts as they know them the thing for any publication the editorial page lets them wax poetic and and say whatever they right. want to say fair enough yeah. and and so the the RJ prior to last December when they were taken over and bought out, um, they were very libertarian on this issue and they said pot legalization is a good idea. It will bring in revenue, it will do less harm, it will take it out of the criminal market and they, since December they've done a 180. I think it goes back even further than that. I think the Review Journal has shown historically throughout the previous ballot initiatives and previous They were times opposed they to were, those ballot initiatives back in 2002 and 2006. But then they've, they turned around after that for the last one. Like after basically 06, 07, they've been fairly supportive of it. Yes, yes, so, they have. They even had a section, the pot news. Yes, they did. Oh, right, which, on their website. Which went away after, yeah. uh, after the new management oh, bought it. But in all fairness, this you know, it wasn't on the front page it was on the editorial but it wasn't the front page of their facebook it, page it was on the front page of their online edition mm -hmm. and it generated so many comments and complaints hundreds of them that the rj editorial board removed they, it yeah they took the facebook link down too yeah it was uh surprisingly fast how quick it went up and down you know yeah. Just an overwhelming public response. That, that shows that we're in a, I mean, we're on a good track, though. I mean, if the public is so, so in our corner on it, mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 I keep thinking, oh, you know, we're in big trouble. We're not going to get the legalization. But, man, after I saw that, it really gave me a little bit of hope. Well, there, there's a criminal defense attorney in town by the name of Christopher Tillman uh, who wrote a good uh, counterpoint to that that actually got published on the letter to the editor's page. Uh, and uh, he's saying that this is rem reminiscent of reefer madness type propaganda. He says the half-truths are in the editorial are frankly insulting. And, yeah, I, I would agree with that. He says contrary to what's expressed in the editorial, marijuana is not a gateway drug, and this has been disproved repeatedly repeatedly. Um, likewise, it does not cause cancer, mental illness, birth defects, or irreversible brain damage, as was opined. Additionally, it's not physically addictive, and there has been no documented overdose death from its use. Uh, that uh, the half truth that the savings that the taxpayer w will to the savings to the taxpayer will be negligible, considering uh, that there are only 90 state prisoners. Because in the editorial they say there are only 90 people in the Nevada state prison system for pot, and so therefore well, that's such a small number that it doesn't make any difference. But City if you take 30,000 a year times 90, you're up to 2.7 million a year. Well, and I, 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 I find that number might be that number might be skewed too because is that counting the people that are back into prison on parole or parole, probation, probation, breaking probation? Is that just the, they, does they, the city and county jails, mm -hmm. uh, do you the city I mean? and county does jails that that go to the I state system? So. I, I have no idea yeah. as, as uh, to uh, what happens there. One would presume uh, on, on the, the standard basis that what they're talking about are convictions for possession yeah, of cannabis, some sort of you cannabis. know, not trafficking, not you know, not dealing, but straight possession. I noticed on your page there it was talking about them trying to reference marijuana as a gateway drug, but we on the show here have talked about this numerous times about how we've seen evidence to the fact that marijuana can be a gateway out of hard drugs if used appropriately. Indeed, and it is. I don't really appreciate when people attempt to continue this narrative that pot is going to lead people into worse things in life i've never really seen that evident i've never seen that direct evidence people have addictive personalities and get addicted to things like gambling and cigarettes and collecting porn. cars even porn whatever mm -hmm. well i think utah actually just passed an anti-porn law because they were calling it a public health crisis and all kinds of nonsense but still you know like you said don't it, go out in utah without a raincoat <laughs> <laughs> no kidding but yeah it's just one of those things like i i, I we're just going to have to continue to push 
the education and try to get people to see the see the truth. And I I know it's kind of a hard thing. People think, oh, that's a stretch, a gateway out of hard drugs. But I swear it's real. I've seen it. We we've spoken to so many people, especially veterans. And over the years, I've I've run into any number of of medical patients who had harder substance abuse and they have repeatedly told me that cannabis helps wean them off of those substances keep them off of those substances so you know saying that that pot is a gateway drug is is a half truth because it's not a gateway into harder drug abuse it's a gate that swings out of harder mm -hmm. drug abuse and gives people safe harbor and refuge uh, and so the the RJ here is is playing fast and loose with with their perceived version of facts and it's just not well, the real story. I'm gonna, I want to pose a question to both of you real quick. Um, Senator Sigerblum, our godfather here, has, our good has, friend uh, Tick, friend of the show, has someone asked him at a fundraiser once, he said, what do you think about Sheldon coming out against, Mr. Adelson, coming out against the marijuana ballot initiative? And he just kind of chuckled and laughed and he said, I hope that he does because his public perception is so negative mm -hmm. that the ballot initiatives that he supports in town usually fail because people really don't like him. So I want him to continue to try to push this personally mm -hmm. so that the public rejects that. Do you believe that the public could find some kind of anti-Sheldon Adelson voice here in some way just because of what he pulls? Or do you think that his public perception is going up because he's trying to bring the Raiders to town? Or I, I, I think there's a, a good possibility. We are the electorate this year is very unsettled and unhappy in a lot of ways. They're anti-incumbent, they're looking for change. You look at um, the anti-politician uh, Donald Trump who has, has won the nomination. So uh, I would say that the the electorate is unhappy with the status quo and in this sense Sheldon Adelson represents the status quo. It's not necessarily a personal thing, it's a societal thing. Yeah, you know, um, you could say that, that he is an unpopular guy, uh, yet people still fill his casinos here in Macau, sure, you know, wherever. Sure. So um, he's not so unpopular that, that they'll patronize another place instead. He, oh. To be fair though, he doesn't operate locals casinos. <laughs> mm, that's true. And that's the, true. And has he, has he done any of this in the states that he has his casinos in? Well, you know, the odd thing about him is, is he seems to be of two minds because during uh, the, the last election cycle when they had a medical marijuana initiative in Florida, uh, Sheldon Adelson spent about $2 million opposing that. And yeah. even though it got 57% of the vote uh, in favor of it, uh, Florida had a 60% threshold. So unlike any other state where the majority means 50% plus one, in Florida's system, that means 60% plus mm -hmm. one. But while he was funding the prohibitionist campaign, he was simultaneously funding research on medical marijuana in Tel Aviv, at the University of Tel Aviv. Really? And so, you know, it's, it's really uh, a strange dichotomy there. That's very strange. Um, I heard also that he was applying for a gaming license in Florida, or maybe pursuing one also, and I, I don't know if that has anything to do with why he put the money down there, but... You know, it's just one of those. It's I just think, one of those conspiracy I, I theories think he, people are putting out there. He would find there. a friend in Governor Rick Scott of Florida, so um, mm -hmm. you know that's that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, you know, any any business wants to expand. But from so, what I've been told, you know, see, this is another thing. Me and you were talking about: is it really Sheldon, or is it his wife that's pushing this narrative? Because if he's giving money over here to the Israelis to push mm -hmm. medical marijuana, you know, like I said, who knows what it is, and it doesn't really matter at this point. We just have to continue to push the educational well, narrative, and, I suppose. Well, and you're, you're right about his wife. Tragically, uh, she lost uh, a child to drug abuse, and um, that was hard drugs. It had nothing yeah. to do with cannabis whatsoever, but as so many of the prohibitionists do, they lump everything together and say that, um, you know, pot is as bad as heroin, is as bad as meth or yeah. anything like that and so there even though there's no basis for that um, there are a lot of people in the substance abuse treatment industry in law enforcement uh, in various in, in incarceration for-profit prisons who stand to make a lot of money if pot stays illegal in in these various places and so uh, you will find that they are the they are without uh, scruples, it seems to me, uh, when they will go and uh, latch on to a grieving mother and fill her with, with all of this phony crap and 
get her ire up and misdirected. So I, I, I don't even know if I would blame her as much for this as the people who are putting these words in her ears. Fair enough. So. Fair enough. Yeah, and uh, well, another nice thing I noticed that after the review journal, review journal came out with their articles, that mm -hmm. the Sun started publishing, kind of firing back at them. And is would you say a little bit, you know, they <laughs> put, a, put some pro cannabis articles out themselves? Well, the, the so. Sun has always you know, been uh, editorially um, uh, different than the RJ. The RJ has. Tr Traditionally, been uh, more of a conservative right-wing publication, whereas the Sun has been more progressive and and liberal. And so, uh, it's not surprising to see that happen. Uh, and they, the Sun, published a, a list last week of about a dozen. Uh, present and former state lawmakers who said they're supporting this initiative mm -hmm. and they're going to vote for it. And they put an editorial out uh, on Sunday, in their Sunday edition, uh, by Pat Spearman. And she says, I am a Nevada state senator. I served for almost 30 years in the Army Military Police Corps. I am an ordained minister. This is her speaking. Uh, I believe marijuana use uh, and possession should be legal for adults and its production and sales should be registered. Wonderful. You know, and yeah, so wonderful. I'd like excellent. to see more ordained ministers push the narrative, push that oh. conversation because I feel like a lot of religious pre-existing religious dogma or the perception that their religious dogma withholds them from supporting the marijuana initiative needs to be addressed because, you know, um, religious like I said, religious groups basically push societal standards in America and have for hundreds of years. It's imperative that they're educated or at least willing to talk about this issue. And for now, you know, they're not so, you don't see a lot of religious types talking about this very much. Very, very, very few and very not so often. <laughs> the, la the last time around Scaringly. that we had an initiative like this, in 2006, uh, a couple of months before the election, uh, there was uh, published a list of uh, people of the cloth, uh, whether they be clergy or nuns or, or whatever, um, who were out in support of this. And oh, wow. It, yeah, it was about three dozen people on that list. And so uh, there was tolerance, there was support for it, but you're correct in that the overwhelming um, number of people who have taken up um, uh, the faith as, as their means of, as their calling, um, are against this. They're very mm -hmm. socially conservative and they, what they're doing though is largely in error because they are comparing cannabis with alcohol. And if you were to read the Bible, cover to cover, Genesis to Revelations, you are not going to find cannabis mentioned at all. In the old Talmudic test texts, um, there is a reference to cannabosum, uh, the holy anointing oil, which is made with cannabis as one of its ingredients. Mm -hmm. But in the Bible itself, there is no mention uh, about cannabis whatsoever. There are a couple of mentions about wine or alcohol, but people have taken those mentions and transferred it onto this subject. Well, they perceive it as an evil thing. I like, uh, my mom lives in Alaska and she was talking to some people on an online forum. Like she's really strictly conservative uh, evangelical Christian mm -hmm. and um, she smokes cannabis and you know, it's recreationally legal in Alaska. And she is just very disappointed with the vibe that she gets from these online forums basically the consensus is that if you smoke cannabis you're going to go to hell mm -hmm. and that is outrageous because i truly feel that if there are people doing god's work it's people like marijuana activists doing their thing trying to put themselves out there putting the risk of their freedom and their family's freedom and their the risks of you know burning relationships with people and job opportunities and things like that in order to help people acquire their medicine if that's not god's work i don't know what is i i agree and the, and the very concept that you mentioned that they say cannabis is evil or anything is evil. Um, would you consider strawberries to be evil? 
Well, I suppose if you were horribly allergic to peanuts yeah. or something. Well, I was going to say, I, was gonna say if, if I was to consider any plant evil, it'd be something like poison ivy or poison oak. The, the, <laughs> or re cactuses. the reason I say that, though, is, is because although, you know, we love strawberries on our shortcake and our ice cream, however we want them, um, the migrant laborers who are forced to oh. stoop over every day, eight, ten hours a day, they call it the devil fruit. It breaks and, their back. You know, even though they're eking out a living from this, yes, it, it breaks their back and it takes a toll on them physically. Um, I don't believe that anything out there, uh, any natural substance is evil. Just the way is I don't believe like dogs or cats are evil. Like Even the free trade like chocolate cats. thing or the, the blood diamonds thing. It's like you have this chocolate and you're like, oh, it's delicious. But the people over there in Africa who are making it mm -hmm. have probably never even tasted a refined chocolate bar in their entire life and make next to nothing. And, you know, in that perception, it probably is probably. A but is not the thing. substance or the animal no. that is evil. It is what people do with it right you know that makes that makes the difference and those perceptions do change all right and uh with that it's time for us to take our first break and we'll be right back Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the DigiPath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. You're listening to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Now, here again, the Weekend Radio Team. <laughs> Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, coming to you live from the studios at Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corp. So, uh, we, were just talk we were just talking about the uh, debate going on between the newspapers, and uh, we were talking about Pat Spearman at the Review Journal. She sounds like a great or, guest. Or state senator. Or, or state yeah. senator, and she published in not the, the journal. Sun. Yeah. She sounds like a great guest. Maybe we should reach out to her and try to Absolutely. have her on the show. I would, I, would love to, I'd love to hear some more of her mm -hmm. opinions. Okay. So, 
Um, with that, there was uh, another article that came out in the in the, in the Sun, Sun. Uh, about the lawyers. Yeah, um, it's entitled "With State and Federal Marijuana Laws in Opposition: Attorneys in Nevada Waiting to Exhale." Uh, and basically, the Nevada Supreme Court is considering revisiting and revising their rules of professional conduct for attorneys by adding a clause saying that the sale or use or possession of marijuana, uh, even when allowed by state laws, is prohibited by federal law. And I got to say right here, any attorney who doesn't know that shouldn't be able to pass the bar to begin with. <laughs> I, I don't know why we need the Nevada Supreme Court to, to, to clarify tell them. that. Yeah, you know? no kidding. Uh, and, but what they do say is, the is, is, besides being prohibited, it could result in misconduct actions. And so um, the court is seeking comments and uh, they're uh, going to schedule a review at 1 p.m. on July 7th so if you want to go down and, and make your comments heard what we'll do is before then uh, and on the uh, our weekend website we will uh, we will post the location of, of this uh, to see whether it's going to be a, a serious effort at looking at the issue or just another clown car show um, <laughs> We'll find out. Um, the, the hearing was requested by the State Bar of Nevada seeking guidance from the court on the role of attorneys in the industry under its rules professional conduct. Yeah. And I think that's in part because of the way this law was, was rolled out. It was the, the wealthier, the politically connected who stood the best chance of getting licenses, and attorneys often fall in both of those classes. Yeah, there were, and there attorneys were, ended up owning a lot of pieces of these dispensaries. Yeah, Indeed. and that's exactly what they're looking at here. They're like, can these people own the a lawyer own a part of a dispensary? Well, so. the lawyers are cleaning up. The lawyers cleaned up better than the business owners for sure. Yeah, some there of were them lawyers did. who ended up with six-figure checks and 10% of the mm -hmm. business. Yeah, <laughs> but now you have the lawyers are fighting back and they're saying, why didn't you do this like you did with the casino workers and the people in the alcohol oh, industry? Oh, issue exactly. guidance beforehand. That beforehand, exactly. before they went all in or invested, you know, six well, figures plus well, they into They talked this, about that. this a little bit, but it never really went anywhere. I remember hearing discussions about this, like whispers of this issue coming out when the bill was being mm -hmm. uh, thrown out there in 13, but... Uh, like there was talk of it and then here we are all these years later now like it never came to a head until until recently well one local lawyer Gary Schnitzer is a minority owner in Oasis Medical Cannabis Dispensary and he said he has sunk six figures into the opening and operating of the of the legal store and even as a minority owner I can absolutely see that because I know oh. of any number of people who are licensees who are spending six figures in, into seven figures to get this thing going and he says that the timing of the state bar's recommendation to review these policies is odd and and it's unfair saying that it should have been figured out in 2013 as mm -hmm. you were just yeah, saying yeah, exactly. before the licenses for the new dispensaries were issued he, he says because of this, this threat of sanction against the attorneys, they will feel compelled to liquidate, and that means they're going to have to sell at a cheaper price because everyone knows if you're forced into selling, you're not going to be able to hold right. out for top dollar. Oh, yeah. okay. So it, it, it's a really uh, goes against crazy the principles of free market up. capitalism. It, it does. It does. You know, these law license holders who are trying to hang on to their dispensaries could face any punishments based on the severity of their misconduct and you know the misconduct here is not state level misconduct everything that they would be talking about potentially is allowed and administered by the division of health but because it's federally illegal somebody could make a complaint and these guys could could face sanctions over it so does that mean that the court themselves would go to the federal government and ask them to look at this or are they just kind of issuing guidance in case the feds were to come. Like, I don't exactly understand where they're going with this. Like, they're basically shadowly threatening these people. Mm. Yes. They're, they're like, actually, it's not you, so subtle, actually. They're directly yeah. threatening them. They're yeah. saying, make a choice. You got one or the other. You can either keep your, your law license. Okay, sh well, that's a very nice way of putting into, it. I perceive it as a threat. The dispensaries and, are and that's exactly enemies. what happened with the Gaming Control Board yeah. in 2013. Mm -hmm. They yeah. said if you're going to own a casino, you're not going to own an MME or vice versa.
Yeah, right as people were starting to cut checks for the yeah, investments but, and things like that. It, 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 that one that one messed up a couple of people, but at least they didn't let it get to this point where I mean they've oh that would have been a been nightmare. Right oh now my for god, what, two years, almost three years for some of these companies to get open, and these these lawyers have been riding this ride, and you okay, know, so answer now me this. somebody to come and yank this out from underneath answer their me feet. This. The gaming mm -hmm. control issue was a was a front page article. Mm -hmm. No one seems to care about this. It's right. all it's buried. Why? Why? Why Maybe is it a public perception like against lawyers? <laughs> is that what it is? Or? Well, you know, it's not against lawyers per se. But are you really gonna walk into your lawyer's office and say, "Oh, geez, I've got such chronic back pain," and he's gonna say, "Here, have two joints and call me in the morning." Do you, you know, is it really? Are, are the lawyers the the best ones to make your medical decisions for you? And granted, they're just coming in and investing yeah, in just, these places, but it's that owners. it's that public perception that um, that they want to get their hands into everything. Yeah, but why so that's why I think there's not a, a are lot of gaming operators problem. the people who should be opening dispensaries if we're gonna go that way? And why? Like well, I said, why was it such a big deal? You know what I mean? I don't. What the hell do gaming operators know about cannabis? Mostly nothing, except we they don't like and yeah, it. Yeah, and, and exactly. And and lawyers are something that's needed in a cannabis business. Mm -hmm. So, for for a lawyer True. to be on your board or be get you know shares of interest in your company, maybe even in, for some trade for the services for the company. Yeah, you know what but, I mean? but not that, a single that, dispensary you know. that I know of is using one of their partners to do their legal representation. They're all outsourcing it to other people. Is that the old saying, even a lawyer, like a lawyer who uses himself for a lawyer has a fool for a lawyer? <laughs> has a fool for a client. Yeah. A fool for a client, yeah, <laughs> yes. a fool for a client. Sorry, I'm trying to... No, 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 but yeah, you've, yeah. Got, the, you've got the right got the idea, idea there. So, um, you know, we're, we're gonna see where this goes. This is, you know, um, the Nevada Supreme Court is is a very conservative uh, group of justices, um, and uh, as I'd mentioned in a previous show, um, I had seen Justice Hardesty at a at a hearing a few months back, and he wanted to know if people were complaining to the Division of Health uh, that that marijuana edibles were making them hallucinate, and. So, this is on the Nevada Supreme Court. Yes, and that's kind of yes. scary. He's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That's that's so. kind of scary. Mm -hmm. How? Okay. Well, well, it just shows we're not really doing enough in our quest to educate people in Nevada. We don't animals. have edibles strong enough in Nevada to do that yet. <laughs> that's exactly true. Because what happens is, uh, although the the limit for uh, cannabinoids in edibles is um, higher in Clark County, the city of Las Vegas took a very restrictive view mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. and because all of these producers want to be able to sell to the widest possible market, they're, uh, they're limiting to 100 milligrams what they're putting in each of these edibles and that just means people are going out and spending twenty thirty dollars on an edible and they're ha that instead of lasting them six doses it may only last them two doses. Yeah, they're, they're, doses. they're definitely not strong enough but in the county they have 320 milligram chocolate bars mm -hmm. available now. The price on them is, you know, kind of high. Yeah. You see, you're going to pay $45 for that candy you see, bar. So when I was working but, in, ho oh, sorry, go ahead. But at least we don't have an all-out war on gummy bears like they're having in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I mean, July 1st, you can't even buy gummy, just gummy bears. All the other candies and all that stuff is fine, but you they will have, not be able to buy gummy bears. They have because gummy crack for kids now. Propensity to eat worms or something. Like that. Yeah. Well, no, that's nonsense. They have gummy version of like yeah. Adderall and, yeah, exactly. and Ritalin for yeah, young gummy kids. Gummy speed for kids. Yeah, now. they have gummy speed, but gummy <laughs> cannabis for adults. Mm -hmm. is somehow illegal. This is ridiculous. Well, this is, this is another trope of the prohibitionists that is disprovable in scientific fact. They're saying uh, that you know, you can't make these edibles where they're attractive to kids because kids are going to use them and you're going to have more kids going to the emergency room and this and that. But in fact, uh, state after state where you have medical cannabis use, uh, you have lower incidence of yeah, there is underage a, use. There's an article here. One of these yeah. one of these articles we have references that. Yeah, the that the changes in state marijuana laws associated uh, with declining teen use. Mm -hmm. So, and that was uh, coming from uh, actually the deputy uh, director of Normal, Paul Armartino, put out a statement saying, "The passage of statewide laws regulating the consumption of cannabis by adults and/or qualified patients is not associated with increased rates of teenage marijuana use." And according to a statistical analysis of results from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention's 2015 Risk Behavior Survey, so they uh, reported the CDC reported that uh, 
a percentage of the high, the high schoolers ever having used cannabis fell from an estimated 43% in 1995 to just under 39% in 2015. He was talking about this last week, the forbidden fruit thing. Once you take it away, it's not a big deal. Absolutely, and that's the, the study I was referring to uh, showed that from 2003 to 2012, teen use of cannabis actually went down, and that coincided with increased availability of medical marijuana and, and once again, not being the forbidden fruit, if and, it's on grandma's uh, right. coffee table, you know, it, it, it's not that it's cool. Nor it's normalized, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We were talking about how expensive these edibles are at the local shops, and that's what's preventing me from purchasing the edibles, because mm -hmm. I can get them from a gray market guy mm -hmm twice as strong for half the price and it's just the market hasn't gotten there in Nevada yet it will but example when I was working at the store in California a long time ago we had a company called I've talked about them all the time Corova used to make these they called them the black bars the big brownies that had like a hundred milligrams of T uh, CBD and a thousand milligrams of THC mm. and we would sell those for 40 bucks like cra as soon as we got them in they go right out the door because people just couldn't get enough of them and uh, like that's kind of the price point where where we need them at eventually to mm -hmm. be able to get people to use these not so like like I said there's a lot of tar involved with mm -hmm. with smoking like we need to be, get people the availability because it's just too expensive now you're yeah. not going to go into the well, store and spend thirty dollars on a pack of macaroons like that have a hundred milligrams of THC in them it's, I'm not going to do it well they have they now have the baker's batches you can buy an ounce of the the high end trim the sugar yeah I've heard that. that and it's like a hundred to a hundred and twenty dollars yeah, an depends ounce on you know where yeah you I've from. seen yeah. them down as low as eighty and uh, you can use those to make your own edibles at home I mean yeah, yeah. that's 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 the way I've, I appreciate I that by so. the way that they're pushing that stuff out like that so yeah. people can choose and they, to do they it even, themselves. They even have the butters. You can buy the butters, pre, you know, sticks mm -hmm. of butter already now. Mm -hmm. You can buy coconut oils. You can buy olive oils now. That's so awesome. So the stuff that's coming out, I mean, there, there is stuff to, to make your own. I mean, but you can also buy the flour at the discounted rates and make your own butters and own Except oils. that that's not legal <laughs> to, to be making an extracted or, or yeah, manufactured you know, product the, the, I, in the I, state I, of I fully believe that their intent on the, that law was to stop open blasting and things that are danger. Um, I don't think that they're going to come into me as a patient and give me a hard time about making my own caramels or my own chocolates or my own cookies at home for my own use because they would look mighty bad doing that when there's people out there openly selling all over the place. You uh, unless I mean? you just happen to be a really out there activist who was just annoying them and they <laughs> wanted to mash down upon you regardless of uh, whether they That's, actually wanted to get it. That tends to happen. <laughs> um, I can assure you it does. Uh, you know, one of the things, we're, we're talking about these higher prices. Uh, one of the things that really surprises me, when I, in 2009, 2010, when I had my dispensaries in Colorado and here in Nevada, um, I had a company up in Colorado where we used to get these little candy dots that were, oh, I guess maybe the size of a quarter and uh, half an inch high in the middle. And um, I would buy these things, and they, they were all canna infused. I would buy them for a dollar a piece. And you know, you'd mark them up to five dollars, not really selling them there, but somebody's coming in, getting this, getting that. Here, have a few, have a few. And they were remarkably inexpensive. So now I see the prices of edibles here in uh, in Nevada and in other markets have just kind of skyrocketed. And I wonder mm. how much of that is due to Nevada has some of the tightest regulation and testing standards in the country. Mm -hmm. So how much of it is added expense due to that? Uh, the flour is cheap, though. Yeah, and well, yeah. you got to figure on the production end of it. A lot of the times, it has to be tested twice. So you're paying mm -hmm. six hundred to thousand dollars per batch for testing. That's for every five pounds you have tested. Mm -hmm. And say you want to infuse it into something, they have to test the flour. Then you have to make your thing. Then they take a batch of that and they test that again. So you're basically paying for testing on an edible twice, right. and it's not cheap. You know, you're paying almost a thousand dollars per every five pounds just for testing. And, and that was actually problems as, as this industry got started last year, where initially um, our friend Tick Siegerblom said, "Grow as much as you can as a patient, and then you know do your one-time sale into the." Dispensary. I remember that. Well, for uh, for a lot of people, though, the county took the line that no, two and a half ounces is the limit. So for a patient to try to go into a dispensary and say, "Here, I want to sell you this two and a half ounces." 
it, it's not worth it. It's, it's not, not worth it. it because of the testing. You you would have to test each batch just you know, as if that, it were a five pound. That line. really kind of pissed mm. me off. That sucked how the way the that went down. I was really kind of hoping that at least a few of the patients were going to be able to do something mm -hmm. with that and mm -hmm. make a little bit of money for themselves possibly and show their expertise. Because really what I was hoping for is these people come to the dispensaries and the dispensaries go, man, this is so good. How'd you like to be a part of this? And that would be how a lot of the patients would be able to enter the legal market. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then that's where they came in they, right after all this and that a lot of the patients were trying to make donations, you know, say, right. hey, just, you know, giving them samples of their stuff. Yeah, so it's just, try it, you know. yeah. Right. it just but, didn't roll the yeah, way I wanted it to. But unfortunately, it has to go all the way up through a dispensary before it can even come off and be tested by any yep. of the employees of the MMEs legally. So and And for all our, you know, bitching and moaning here. Um, you know, I just read something that in New York, which has a medical marijuana program, there was almost no availability. And so, yes, we are kind of overregulated on this, and, and it is a challenge, but there's certainly no shortage of medicine in the oh, state. Yeah. I'm, as, I'm as happy. Yeah. I'm so yeah. proud and happy that we've come so far so yeah. quickly, for the, sure. The, mm -hmm. You know, and speaking of price, the flour prices, they're, I mean. Well, they're falling through the floor. Yeah, they're still, oh, yeah. there's $200 ounces everywhere right now. And you just got to look I, I'm around. I'm getting blasted and, you with you know. email and text message specials mm -hmm. every day. $10 grams, $9, $8, mm -hmm. 777 grams for the weekend special, blah, blah, so, blah. Every, every, all kinds of stuff. And that's because, you know, we have all these grows coming online and we mm -hmm. have a, we have mm -hmm. a great exactly. supply. You know, and that's, quality starting to go up that's another thing that we got to keep in mind. I'm, I'm still 100% for yes on two, mm -hmm. but when when two passes and we bring that recreational market in, we're going to have a rise in the price of our You're medicine. You're going to see again. what happened in Colorado, where December 21st, December 31st of 2012, you had $25 an eighth medical marijuana that overnight morphed into $70 an eighth recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. So so what? So be it. Here, you know. And so oh, let the free we, market we, dictate. We, I'm I'm good with that. I'm, I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying yeah. it's going to happen. Oh, yeah. yeah, and that's that's where, we, you know, as soon as we can make a changes into this bill, we need to change that. Some of that tax money goes to back into the medical marijuana program well, to help support that and bring the prices down on that end. Currently, so. the, the tax structure on question two, and boy, it's in small type, says <laughs> that uh, they're, they're going to put on a 15% excise tax on wholesale marijuana uh, sales to be paid by licensed cultivators. So the seller is going to be paying that. And the retail oh. marijuana sales will be subject to standard state and local taxes, so eight and change percent, mm -hmm. uh, just like any other tangible product. And then the taxes and fees will first be used to fund state and local implementation and enforcement of regulations. So the first money they're going to spend is going to be to hire the cops to come in and watch the agent. To, well, that makes sense. Industry. The program should fund itself. And then all remaining revenue will be deposited into the state distributive school account and used to support public K-12 through education. And this is largely how they are, are selling this to the public because even a couple of years ago the Nevada Retail Association did a, a survey and they found by a 54 to 40 margin that people supported the, the passage of legalized cannabis uh, if the proceeds were going to be used for, um, uh, for, for education. But I think it was you who pointed out that the state can give with one hand and take away he with the He was other. the one who brought yeah, up that point exactly. to me is that according to what you were telling me, Kurt, the state, even though it well, goes into this fund, they can choose to do whatever they want with that well, they, fund. Well, they correct? can just re-divert other money. Right. Yeah. So you know, they can put so a yeah, million in and take the a general million out. fund. The general fund say they're writing this much into the budget from the general fund for education, and then this much comes from the cannabis thing. Well, now they just take a little bit out of what they were already right. giving them. You sneaky bastards! Because they don't need all of that, and they can they can put that money pretty much anywhere so they want. If, if, so if le if legalized cannabis were to generate in the state, let's say thirty million dollars a year, um, and and of that 25 million were going into the educational budget, the legislature could just say, oh, well, here's this money we were going to give you guys, but now we can take this 25 million and it's so difficult it to stop that. How would we write that into legislation to make sure that it couldn't happen? You, you, can't. you, you can't. wouldn't. You can't. Yeah, you can't. You can't. Yeah. That's just, Especially that's really when you have, that's, that's the game of politics. It's, like, it's almost it's almost like the lobbyist. And, but, it's really you know. disheartening and disappointing because you feel like you want to make a positive change and we're like, oh, we're going to put all this money into the schools. but And then we have zero accountability for where it actually goes. We, mm -hmm. can't, we can't prove that it goes there. Yep. Yeah, with that, we're, uh, we're going to go to a break, and we'll be right back with some more Nevada Cannabis News. Damn.
Vatapair is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999 at 702-979-9999 or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. You're listening to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Now, here again, the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, coming to you live from Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corp. So, uh, we were just talking about question two and everything going on there. Yes, so. we were, and uh, the campaign is ramping up. I was on a, a campaign organizing call just this morning, and uh, we're at the point where we are having weekly calls now to strategize and, and get the word out. And so um, uh, with that, uh, what is this initiative going to do? Well, at first, it's going to remove all criminal penalties for personal possession of under an ounce of cannabis or under an eighth ounce of concentrate for all adults, uh, meaning 21 years or older. Um, what it also does is uh, adults will be able to purchase uh, cannabis from licensed retail stores. Yep. Those who do not live within 25 miles of a retail marijuana store will be allowed to grow up to six marijuana plants and in an enclosed locked area. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to get this question passed. Then, the second thing we have to do is we have to file an equal protection lawsuit that if they're letting people outside 25 miles grow it, then every other citizen who's living within this arbitrary exclusion zone should be able to grow this their own. This is the only state where they have that law. It's just nonsense. Well, it, and it needs a legal challenge. No but doubt. 
we need to pass it we first. have to get it yeah. passed yeah. first, but it, then right away. That went into effect in Arizona when they passed their laws, and they, uh, they did it really? they took it into legal, then got it removed. Yeah. Okay. So. And so hopefully that's going to happen. Here. And it's much the same way that for uh, medical cannabis users in 2013, when they passed the law, uh, they put a sunset provision for growing as of April 1st, 2016. And then in the 2015 session, our friend Tick Siegerblum got it pushed back the sunset to 2018 18. and uh, he has been saying all along that he's hoping that in the next election they're just going to get rid of it entirely but in politics you have to you have to get in what you can get past yeah and mm -hmm. so that's where he's at with that um, with this uh, it will create a system of licensed marijuana retail stores uh, and it will be overseen by the Department of Taxation uh, so this is this is much like Colorado uh, once they went from uh, uh, from medical uh, into uh, rec they they gave it to the Department of Taxation which just has a, a is more set up for collecting this than than the Division of Health. Um, uh, what the initiative will not do is it will not allow marijuana to be used in public. So no lighting up joints on the strip. You're just going to have to vape like everybody else. Uh, you know, no worries. It I, does, I, I don't want to see people smoking joints on the strip. It's publicly offensive to people who are here with their families. If we want to be normal members of society, we have to try to blend in with them. And there's nothing wrong with medicating discreetly. Absolutely That's nothing wrong with discretion. Edibles and vape pens. Yeah. I mean, you can pretty much use them anywhere. Understand that if this passes, it will not change the existing laws regarding driving under the influence. And this is well, another law then that we're going to have to get changed. I, and I have a question on sure. that. Are, are recreational users going to be able to ride amusement park rides, surf, and, and, uh, and water ski? <laughs> yeah, you can't do that under the <laughs> because as a medical session, user, yeah. I'm not supposed to. You're cautioned to. against it yes, in, in the medical <laughs> so. paperwork. Well, that's just part of the state covering its butt uh, in in trying not to get sued for from some patient who goes and does that and has an adverse result. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I really but the, like water skiing. The problem, though, with the driving under the influence, as we know and as we've discussed before, is that for anyone who uses cannabis, even intermittently with a with a a regular frequency uh, is going to be above the two nanogram limit that is currently in our state law and um, we're going to have Senator David Parks on the show as, as an, a guest and uh, he had uh, in he had introduced a bill in 2013 and then reintroduced I believe in 2015 which would have uh, raised that from two to five nanograms which is still too low so hopefully if we can get this passed we're going to be able to to have um, not a per se limit that it's in your blood so you're presumed to be high but actual uh, objective testing of the individual as to whether they're uh, to whether they're under the influence and and technology is moving forward with the, with that they have cheek swabs now that can determine active from inactive metabolites whether you smoked in the last four hours so there's a lot there, there's a lot that needs to be done even after this happens uh, it will not change employment policies so if they say you can't smoke and can't test dirty you you won't have an appeal there it doesn't change existing medical marijuana law and it does not allow private unlicensed individuals to sell so um, you know it, it's not like it's going to be a, a an open market for people um, you know it's it, like the, the the current medical marijuana law it's going to be very structured because people out there who don't really know the weed are deathly afraid of it yeah and, and you there, there are, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, um, one more story we can cover before we end this update uh, okay. about the uh, Colorado State University studying marijuana legalization's impact on communities. Mm -hmm. So did you have anything else? Well, on actually, that? yeah, you've got something there, Perry. Yeah, there's a thing. The Colorado State University in Pueblo will, re will be receiving $270,000 in marijuana excise tax revenue for research following a, a unanimous vote Monday by the Pueblo County Board of Commissioners. Commissioner Sal Pace said $220,000 of it will go to medical marijuana research and $50,000 will be used for societal impact studies. There's been a real... Uh, a lot of research on cannabis in general in the last 50 years, well, but a not dearth of research. Well, there's not, not yeah, well, there's yeah. not enough. You know, yeah. and there needs to be more. And this mm -hmm. kind of money is 
so desperately needed. Yeah, and so yet it's, it's small money considering Colorado took in uh, twenty plus million dollars last year. You know, you're only talking about one percent of the tax revenue that they collected, but still, it's a step forward. Well, yeah. they. On June 6th, Governor Hickenlooper signed a bill that would award $900,000 to the university. Mm -hmm. For them to take that much of that and mm -hmm. put it to marijuana use, I, 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 I mean, it's good that they know where the money came from, and at least they're trying. They're, go they're certainly going in the right direction it's, here. Yeah. And that's the kind of money that we're hoping to see come out of the recreational end here into Nevada. Oh, so man, I think like we'll that. blow their numbers because away. I think our yes. tourism will be much better than And especially, well, the tourism. news was breaking that we're so. getting the NHL and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just yeah. going to drive their tourist numbers through the roof. You mean so. Seager Bloom Hayes is going to blow away the Rocky <laughs> Mountain High? No doubt. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> so, uh, that, that, we're kind of running low on time here. Uh, you want to check out our events. Uh, we don't have a whole lot on the calendar here. We're looking to book some new stuff up, so keep uh, keep an eye out on our website, wecan702.org. We got our patients group uh, support group out in Pahrump on June 25th. That's a Saturday at 2 o'clock. And first Friday on July 1st, uh, all new dope soaps coming out and stuff like that. Big shout out to uh, Original Genius and uh, Vegas Hat Pins for the new logo. Uh, look for these hat pins coming out soon. We're, we're putting them out. They're going to be at all. We're going to be at all of our events. So come on and get yourself a Vegas hat pin uh, with We Can 702 on it. And uh, we hope you enjoy these shows. We try to keep them informing, informative. We try to keep them uh, of, of interesting and and you know thoughtful conversation. Uh, Come on to our Facebook page. Leave us some comments. Let us know what you think about these topics. Suggest yes, new topics. And uh, be a part of this. You need to be part of this revolution. Get yourself out there registered to vote is a good first step. Thank you very much.